Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. I know it's quite a late session. I'm glad the room is filled. Now, globalization needs a reset. Given the collapse of uh, TPP, a US that's retreating, a China that's expanding its influence, new approaches are needed to, I guess, explore the opportunities to trade and navigate the risks. Add to that, we have rising protectionism, populism, uh, not to mention great disruption caused by technology, the fourth industrial revolution. It is not the world we knew before. So what does it all mean for Southeast Asia, the ASEAN region, and what does it mean for trade? I'm very pleased to introduce to you our panelists today, Pan Sarasak, Minister of Commerce, Cambodia, Arancha gonzalez Laya, International Trade Center, Vivek Bhaktia, ThyssenKrupp Asia Pacific, William Maloney, right at the corner there, World Bank, and of course we have Professor Xue Li from uh, the Institute of World Economics and Politics, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Now, it's been 110 days since Trump took office. What is the sense out there? Is there greater optimism about free trade or not? I'll go with Arancha. Yeah, right. So, um, I, I guess it's the inevitable question these days when you go into a session on trade, what uh, is the Trump effect on trade? I think uh, there is uh, something that um, the, de the debate in the U.S. has brought home, uh, which is the difficulties we have in our societies with managing globalization. And it's not just trade, it's globalization, because I don't think the driving force of globalization is trade, it's, it's called technology. But what the debate in the U.S. has brought to us, and not just in the, U in the U.S., it's hit uh, Europe, and in my view, is going to spread beyond uh, the developed countries, is that we have to pay more attention to how we distribute the costs and the benefits of globalization. And this 1% versus 99% is not sustainable in the long term. Now, that's where uh, I think the debate has been good where I think the debate is a bit more mixed is in what kind of response we provide to this question of distribution of the costs and benefits of globalization. Some think that the answer to this is to put protectionist measures at the border, mean use trade uh, as a means uh, to cure that, address that challenge. And others say, uh, and frankly, I put myself into the second category, is not about, uh, essentially, it's not about trade policies. You can't plus minus correct the trade policies, but it's got to do with a very heavy, difficult domestic agenda that uh, works on building the competitiveness of your economy, the skills in your people, uh, the infrastructure uh, and the uh, soft and hard infrastructure that will allow you to better manage the challenges of globalization. So uh, from where I see it, trade protectionism, which is what uh, you uh, want me uh, to address uh, in my uh, comment, is the intellectually lazy way to address the much deeper challenges uh, that globalization poses to us. Your views, William, from the World Bank? I mean, even G20 pulled back on its comment on protectionism. Uh, I don't know if it's a view of the World Bank per se, but I, um, I think we do have to take a long view of, of this process of integration over time. What we've seen in terms of trade integration and investment integration over the last half century or so has been tremendously good for developing countries, obviously. And I think that wasn't just done because governments thought it was a good idea. There were strong forces uh, in the economies of the advanced countries that find it very beneficial as well. And I think those forces are still there. So I think if we take a longer view and don't, uh, uh, you know, don't assume this is the end of, the, uh, of, the, of an open world, I, th I think we'll be better off. But I have to agree with Arancha that uh, we need to prepare the economies that are opening for being open. Uh, and I'll just give you, you know, one example of it, if you, if you look at the World Management Survey, which is conducted by Stanford and, and now MIT, uh, Singapore and Japan among Asian countries are quite well managed, have very good firms. I mean, the important thing is that nations don't trade 
firms trade, right? Um, and so you have to have firms that can take a long horizon, that can strategize, can build a workforce, and a, have a H HR policy to prepare them. And most countries at the level of, say, Vietnam or Myanmar don't have that. Um, so if you really want to have a dynamic response to trade, uh, trade, re, uh, trade agreements open the door, but you have to have firms that are capable of going through that door, and that means getting their skills up as managers, it means getting this, the workforce up to speed, and it means having the rule of law so that firms can grow. Uh, it means a whole set of behind the border things, which I think we may be losing sight of a little bit as we focus entirely on, on trade agreements themselves. What is the private sector perspective, Vivek? So, uh, you know, from our point of view, very clearly we support trade, free trade. Um, and in a way, it's good simply because it allows efficient allocation of capital. You know, you want to have resources placed in those locations where they are most productive. Uh, and ultimately, that's good for everybody involved. It's good for the consumers because they get cheaper prices. It's good for the economies where those investments go in because, you know, obviously they're contributing against their sweet spot. Um, but it does come back to a question around skills. You know, when you look at uh, a particular economy and you want to invest, it's really a question of locally, do they have the skill sets to be able to deliver the kind of products and goods and services that we are looking to manufacture? And um, that's where I think part of the issues around trade emerge because many times people have the feeling we have a huge population, we have a huge market, and we want to reserve you know, the benefits of production within this uh, uh, construct. But that's not always efficient, and that's not always desirable. Uh, so in that sense, I think trade is definitely very much required. Uh, but it needs to come with a thinking on what are therefore the associated skills uh, that need to be developed rather than use trade barriers as a means to enforce local um, investments. Focus more on the skills and the ability to produce more effectively uh, rather than you know, create barriers to, to create artificial basis for attracting investment. You know when TPP collapsed, when the US pulled out of TPP, it made headlines, but does it really matter? I mean, TPP, now we're talking about TPP minus one, but even without the TPP, there is RCEP, there is AEC. What are your thoughts on it, Minister? Well, uh, you know, from the Cambodian standpoint, um, when TPP was, was alive, and we have uh, done studies for Cambodia, and we, we have uh, trade erosions for about 30%, because of the, the fact that uh, most trade will go to uh, members of TPP, would go to members of TPP, so our trade will, uh, will, will lose, we, Cambodian will lose. So we were, we were quite concerned, and we, we tried to, you know, that was um, my, I did try to raise up the awareness uh, to the leaders, and uh, leaders is aware of that, and uh, they, were, um, they, they were really concerned uh, in Cambodian standpoint. And, but just stop that and looking at uh, Cambodia is, is supporting the regionalisms. We, we, we don't want protectionisms at all uh, in these regards. So you can see what I'm saying here that uh, if TPP is collapsed, Cambodia is happy. Why? Because we can, uh, we can prosper. We can prosper as we, we go along, especially from our government. We, 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 uh, we've done a quite uh, a good uh, uh, revenues for about eight billion U.S. dollars per year, exporting to uh, different countries, to uh, to EU, to United States, and so on. But this one here, uh, uh, that's why uh, we see that okay, uh, Trump uh, was not doing it for Cambodia, but uh, Trump is doing it for, for for himself for the U.S. But here, this is what affects that we feel. Going on the uh, um, that's why ASEAN as a whole now looking and concentrating themselves to make ASEP works. ASEP is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnerships, which is uh, ASEAN plus six. Six is China, India, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. That will, uh, it's ASEAN and which 
ASEAN centrality, with ASEAN centrality. So everybody is just working with, uh, with uh, consensus and then working. And uh, this sort of put an impetus and also accelerates our negotiations of uh, ASEP. And I believe that uh, it will be finalized at the end of this year or, or so. And, um, and we just want to show that, OK, re regionalism is working. And, and uh, we are working side by side together. That wouldn't stop uh, the, 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 the former TPP or failed TPP to, to join us later on in, in the future. And uh, we are very optimistic on creating uh, this kind of trade because it encompassed about half, a mil half of the uh, people in the world. This RCEP is actually a lot bigger than the TPP. Is it possible that RCEP will be rushed to show momentum for free trade, Professor? I strongly believe this. ASEAN get a lot of the benefit from the globalization and free trade. But nowadays, it seems to me, it's just a small zigzag of the globalization. For this one, maybe some country leaders, they change the new uh, administration. They have a different view of the uh, globalization. But it's just a small zigzag, temporarily. In the long run, I totally agree with uh, Meloni, though he's from a developed country and I'm from a developing country, but we have the same shame for the globalization, right? <laughs> <laughs> so because not only even for the United States, for the Trump administration, I, I, I believe TPP is clear but not die yet because the general chain of the free trade is in line with the general main interest of the most countries in the world. Also, of course, it's in line with the uh, industry, like the advanced in the, uh, manufacturing industry, like IT industry. Only problem with this, uh, uh, with, with those, uh, uh, we call it the blue, blue neck or uh, blue collar, blue collar. They, because they are ignored for a long time. Nowadays, they speak out. So government need to pay attention to them. But in the long run, they will also get benefit from the globalization rather than be damaged by globalization. Not to speak the, uh, uh, the new uh, emerging economy like uh, ASEAN and China. Both of us, we get benefit a lot from this one. Without uh, free trade, it's hard to imagine it, what will happen in the world. Arancha, do you agree that RCEP will gain momentum? You see, first, I, I'm not uh, so sure that uh, TPP is dead. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've read a very interesting op-ed written by the Agricultural Secretary of the United States this morning in the Wall Street Journal, title of which is, Farmers in the US Know About the Benefits of Trade. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, what I've read uh, for you know, whatever we can read at the moment in what we hear, uh, is a preference to go and negotiate the deals on a one-on-one -on -one rather than as a group, which to me seems to indicate more a question of how can I maximize my leverage rather than uh, uh, I don't want uh, this agreement. You see, the reality is that TPP and RCEP are two different animals. TPP is smaller in uh, participants, deeper in content. RCEP is larger in participants, shallower in content. Um, in my view, uh, it's a bit early to say that TPP uh, is dead. Uh, uh, and you can see lots of people agitating it uh, and uh, trying to, uh, if there is a minus one, add a few others in the hope that what has been negotiated remains uh, as some sort of benchmark, at least on the rules part, mm -hmm. uh, which is where the agreement is a bit noble. Uh, and I agree uh, with uh, our colleague Lee that RCEP uh, uh, is, some, is a project that existed uh, in parallel with TPP. It was never to be an alternative. It was a bit of a parallel track. Uh, and in my view, it just uh, depends on who's in the driver's seat. In, uh, in RCEP, uh, the, driver's, the driver's seat was pretty clear from the very beginning. <laughs> well, no, it's uh, as in centrality. <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, irrespective of the acronym yes, we are talking about, you know, trade is only going to increase in the region. Uh, 
purely because if you look at ASEAN... Regardless of whether TPP is alive or dead or because right. they're alternative because trade deals. Exactly, because uh, you know, if you look at ASEAN as a region, it needs a lot of infrastructure investments. Right? It needs uh, the ability to access technologies and uh, you know, somebody bringing those equipment in, uh, irrespective of whether there's a trade deal or not. For economic prosperity, all of that has to happen. Right? Infrastructure has to be built. And there, definitely, with uh, the kind of vision that China has articulated and the investments that they've put behind it, I think that flow of trade will happen irrespective of whether you have a RCEP or not. Uh, you know, you see that across countries in the region, you know, there is active bilateral discussion almost every other day. Somebody else or the other is announcing multi-billion dollar investments coming in, uh, courtesy China. So, so I think that trade uh, uh, is on a, on a roll on itself. Um, uh, what I personally uh, think more deeply about is intra-ASEAN trade and how do we g open up within ASEAN uh, a, a bigger market, more unified, which allows local players in ASEAN to scale up and, and uh, really build competitiveness to be able to operate uh, on the world scale. Because individually, these are all tiny markets. Uh, they would never have the capacity to be globally competitive if we don't create a more unified ASEAN. And to me, that's the more interesting question to consider. It's a work in, uh, work in progress. The uh, integrations, we, we know that there's intra-ASEAN trade is still low, but uh, the, the uh, ASEAN member states is looking into that. They even look in, into the barrier of each country, how we can take stocks of that and we can remove it systematically. Uh, this is the initiative that we, we need to do. You need to know that the ASEAN integrations, of course, it started in 2015, end of 15, but uh, it's actually uh, not 100% yet. It's um, probably 2020, which we have a complete. Cambodia has a, has a leeway because of LDCs. We are LDCs. And then we have a, a, a lot of, pref um, a lot of uh, uh, grace. It's fully units. implemented by 2020, but how effective will it be? We talk about intra-ASEAN trade currently stands about 25%. How much growth, how much momentum, how much more well, can that's, be achieved? That, that's the pen of the, uh, the infrastructures, legal frameworks. You know, I think that's, you, you're right, I'm supporting you, your, 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 your thinking that uh, we need more infrastructure, physical infrastructure, which uh, we haven't done that, you know, uh, yet the linking, the connectivity, you know, uh, talking about physical and also electronics, which are very important for, for, uh, for intra-trade to work. And we're talking about E-ASEAN, uh, 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 E-ASEAN, kind of things, but uh, still it's not working. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about going back a little bit on the uh, why, why you think ASEP will work. Because just to think logically that we, we even now, we do, uh, we do export uh, um, more to China than China import to, to, to ASEAN. That gives us a more impetus to get China in, into ASEP, so that even we can do more things, more trade with China, to increase this kind of trade. Right now, not, right now, not, you not even have China in ASEP. You're not having China in, as part of, of the whole regional uh, trade, but we are, making, we are doing more trades with China. So I, we expect that trade will go up also with China in this. So this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, looking outward, uh, looking in, in the future is, is very important. But is it fair to say that if RCEP takes off, the biggest loser could be the U.S.? It would be very difficult for American companies to be integrated. <laughs> I'm not sure I can read facial expressions. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the United States checking out of, of TPP has put them a little bit behind the curve. But again, you have to take a long view of these things. But there are, there are, other, there are the other games in town. Yes. There is an EU-Japan free trade agreement in the making. Yes. That's a game changer. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, part of the TPP, which is to do the agreement with the country that was not uh, part of your network of free trade agreements in this region, all of a sudden, your competitor gets a comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. 
Vietnam European Union free trade agreement. Mm. Vietnam was another reason why TPP was of interest to the United States. So there are many different games being played uh, here in Asia that can change uh, a little bit the posturing uh, on, uh, on trade agreements and can maybe reconcile geopolitics with geoeconomics. How but, you know, uh, when we think about trade, I think we also need to differentiate. There are two levels. One is, you know, the, the blue-collar work that uh, one, uh, one of the panelists here just mentioned. But there's also innovation-driven trade, right? And if you look at Uber and the rate at which they have scaled up, you know, RCEP or not, TPP or not, WT or not, they would have done it, uh, and they would have scaled up just as fast. If you look at Pokemon Go, I think within six months they reached one billion uh, USD of revenue now, you know, and they cut across borders. So there is technology and innovation which will break through all barriers simply because people need it. People want to benefit from that technology. And you could put up tariffs or anything, you know, people will still buy an iPhone, for example, right? So, um, so you know, there's the innovation angle which sort of skims through all of this. And then there's another level where people really talk in hyperbole about you know, blue-collar work and what that means for, for some of the other stuff, uh, which I think will remain a topic for debate. You know, whether, irrespective of whatever we think about uh, the US President Trump, you know, at the end of the day, people voted in the US uh, on, on certain topic with certain beliefs. And you know, those beliefs don't change irrespective of presidency, right? who's on the seat. So the political narrative will follow what the people are talking about and thinking. Um, but nevertheless, I think the differentiation is important. You know, technology will continue to permeate. Uh, innovation will continue to permeate across borders, irrespective. So to answer your question, uh, US with a strong innovation bias will not necessarily lose. I mean, those firms will continue to prosper, driven by technology. I want to touch on the role of China with the U.S. retreating, mm -hmm. China's actually expanding its influence. Sure. And China, Xi Jinping has talked about the China solution for a lot of the problems. Mm -hmm. What role do you see China playing? I think that, generally speaking, China will try its best to play a, a positive role of uh, uh, global uh, uh, globalization and uh, what, uh, what economy growth by different ways, for instance, Generally speaking, now we have the one by one load, the, the initiative, which is a whole package. You can put everything inside, right? But mainly it focus on economy. China now make the one third of the uh, world economic groups, right? One third. That's the most important factors for China. So nowadays, for China, in what it need to do in economic side is to promote free trade which maybe is not so in line with the developed country. They, they now talk about fair trade. Fair trade and free trade, because all the developed countries are good at making coin very new terms, look very nice, right? But this one, we have some uh, small contradiction, but we still uh, share some uh, the same things, this one. And um, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is, I think, uh, Nowadays, because China is very rapidly growth in economy, but generally speaking, China is still at the middle and the low part of the world manufacturing chain, which makes China have no choice but go further in the process of the uh, uh, globalization. I will have uh, two points to make, and one is the, the driving seat problem. Another one is the Trump's uh, uh, the, the, the load of uh, what uh, de uh, development. I I I according to my research, I would believe that Trump. When you talk about the uh, President Trump, we need to go back to his one of the job written by him in uh, 20 years ago, the art of the deal. In his perspective, everything can make a deal. Just generally speaking, not everything. Like the Taiwan issue, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's long to, to put on the uh, table for, the, for, the, for making deal. But I, 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 I also don't think the United States will go back to the isolationism or just to be 
the, what she wants is just get more relative gains because he's, uh, Trump said the United States pays so much contribution to the world, but what he get is not enough. There's a relative gains according to the economy, not enough. We need to get more gains, not only in absolute gains, we also need the relative gains as one thing, especially for the, for the manufacturing industry, one thing. Another thing is the driving, uh, uh, driver's seat. Driver's seat is a good word, but it's not a perfect word. I would like to use another word. There's horses in front of the wagon. <laughs> not, only, not only one horse. Sometimes we need some horses to cooperate to make the wagon go very smooth and fast. Maybe this, this horse now is, get, is tired, okay? Another two uh, horse make, make work better, harder to make things go smoother. I would think, generally speaking, of course, ASEAN is still in driving seat. Maybe in the in some aspect, like what he said, in the different um, sectors, India or China uh, will play more important load in the future. You know, I was going to ask, sorry, were you going to say something wrong? I was just going to say that um, part of what you're saying about him being a, a deal maker is how he defines himself for sure. But he was also reacting to something which I think we have to watch more carefully, which is exactly a large fraction of the advanced countries, or, or the blue-collar workforce in particular, is, is actually feeling the heat, not so much from trade, that's a chunk of it, but from the general move towards automation and, and, and the like. And the, re, the fra fair trade discussion is actually partly a displacement of the concern about automation and the like. Yes. So yes. that's there. I was going to ask if China is creating a new world order, but Aranj is going to say China is not interested in any order. <laughs> no, I think what we are seeing is a more assertive China uh, overall. Good or bad thing? I think it's good because when you represent 30% of international trade, when you, rep when you are the largest emitter uh, in absolute terms of uh, uh, CO2, uh, when, you are, uh, when you are sitting on massive amounts of reserves that you want to uh, put to good use uh, outside your country, it's very good that you become more assertive and that you become more interested in international affairs and that you become uh, more uh, clear uh, about where you sit. Now, we are, I think we have to be clear is that China is not doing this out of some sort of naiveness or generosity. It's doing this because China thinks this is essentially in its interest. Mm -hmm. Just like the US, when it does it, it thinks it is on the, in, in the interests of the US. It's not any different. Now, of course, uh, uh, when you are, again, when you're big and you're playing this and you know this is in your interest, it's likely to create some frictions with uh, people around you. And what we have to do today is manage these frictions that are the result of this huge insertion of China into the world, not just the world economy, but into the world, just like we've seen this with other countries in other moments of our history. What would you like to see from China to match the rhetoric that we've been hearing? I mean, I, I think we are seeing we are seeing quite a lot of uh, deeds put to the words. Uh, when uh, when uh, China says, "I am not going to pull out of the climate Paris Climate Agreement," because it has already started a transition uh, to a more economic uh, uh, in CO2 emissions uh, production system, I think it is doing it. It's not just that it is saying it; it is doing it. Uh, and again, it's essentially in its interest, but uh, by the way, it, it does, a, it does a, a great a good to the world if it reduces its emission when it's the largest emitter of gases today. So we may not agree on every point, and I'm sure that if we open the discussion, and uh, I mean, uh, Pan, uh, Pan and I were just a minute ago uh, in an intimate discussion with uh, ASEAN leaders, and there are tonalities, and they are especially in the geopolitics, certainly in the economics aspects that uh, uh, some countries would like to see uh, China do differently. But this is part of what we have to manage uh, today uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, world uh, that we live in that is no longer bipolar, is multipolar. And it's this multipolarity that is extremely difficult for us to manage because we are not used to having to transact with multiple actors mm. on multiple points. Minister? 
Yeah, I just want to continue. I agree with you what you're saying there. I don't have to. I don't have to elaborate more. But then, uh, when you mention about the free trade and fair trade, which is very sensitive, the the the, the fair trade. Uh, I, however, you 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 mean by that, but uh, put a lot of conditions to 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 smaller countries and to ASEAN as a whole uh, in in order to build for for nation buildings. Uh, we, we need assistance, we need fundings from uh, other countries and mostly from Western countries. Now, uh, in the past, we start to have it, uh, more from China now. This kind of thing here, China, I have a feel that you have fair tr free trade, but, if, but a lot of, a lot of uh, well, Western countries put trade, they want to be fair, <laughs> which are, and then, then like, human rights and those things, which uh, it's, it's uh, how would you say, double standard kind of things. You know, we talk, we're talking about uh, when, when the US bombed Cam uh, Cambodia, uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago and kill all of us, you know, some of us, millions, and you call it uh, human rights? Uh, protections? No, they haven't thought about that. So, why you you keep thinking about now? You need to have, okay, conditions this condition that in order to get get uh, fundings to, to to build our our nation from war, from destruction from war. And that's that's the some kind of uh, doesn't make sense, you know. And I I think it's voice the leaders voice that, you know. Uh, in, how much can be achieved from one belt, one road? Because earlier we talked about how infrastructure is essential for trade to take off. William? Uh, Have you been encouraged by, I mean, from what we know, what since its inception in 2013, about a billion dollars worth of deals have been signed? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the bank is overall really supportive of that. Mm -hmm. uh, of increasing integration generally, the, the obviously the vast amounts that are invent, being invested in infrastructure are a big step towards towards doing that. Again, these things open the door, but you have to have a, for each of the countries that is touched by it. There needs to be a lot of behind the border preparation for them to take advantage of it. No, I think in general, uh, it, it's very, uh, it's a very positive development in the sense that if we look at all the markets which are going to be affected, they needed infrastructure investments anyway. And uh, what it does is it creates access to markets. It creates access for people to new technologies. Uh, it creates access for people to better health care. And so in that sense, I think infrastructure investment is always desirable. Um, I think what everybody has to think really hard on is, as we do these infrastructure investments, we don't just do it for the sake of it, but rather focus on where does it create most value, right? What is the right routing which uh, really benefits local uh, communities in the best possible way? And how do we make sure that there's a win-win on top of, uh, you know, just a pure creation of a road or some infrastructure around What's the it. sense you're getting? Is it a win-win? I know there, there's some criticism out there saying that, you know, when it comes to one belt, one road, China is just exporting talent. It's not creating jobs. Jobs are going back to the Chinese. I mean, is that, is that a fair observation? I, I don't think so. <clears throat> it, it's up to us to tell them what we need to do to build a nation, to build the countries. You know, we need this and that. It's not conditions. You know, you say we, we, we would like to have, a, uh, to, to build an expressway. Okay, from here to here. And if the deal is right, then they build it. So it, I don't think that uh, you, you uh, they dictate anything, you know, uh, so far right now. Um, this is how I feel. Yes, I can, I'd like to make a follow up. Because I visited uh, some uh, uh, economic development zone in Africa, in Cambodia, in other countries. Uh, I also researched one by one for three years. I have published two books. Later, I will give you one. Some, some articles in, in English. According to my research, most of the critics they never make the real field work before they 
raise the criticism. That's one. Second one, I will tell you some. I will tell you some case. One case, just I I uh, uh, some days ago I visited uh, the the Xi'an economic uh, special economic zone. There, totally employed seventeen thousand workers, and then most of them are Cambodian, not Chinese. For instance, one company they export. Uh, Back to the Europe, to the EU, there are four uh, four four hundred workers. How many Chinese uh, workers there? Only nine. Another case is in the in in the Oriental um, uh, economic zone in the, in the, uh, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. They export the shoes to the United States. They employed six thousand workers. How many Chinese? Fourteen. Point one, one Chinese, forty local workers. That's the fact. It, maybe in the future, you colleague may make some the survey on this case. I will tell you, tell you the, 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 the address for further investigation. Fact matters. It's it's a demand driven. It's you know from from a country like Cambodia. And we met, uh, have a chance to meet, uh, to meet uh, President Xi Jinping with the Prime Minister. He said, tell, tell us what you want. We'll, we'll have. It's not that, OK, you do this and this, and you know, it's, okay. it's, yes. it's a request. Your thoughts on it, Arantxa? Yeah, I think um, infrastructure is both hard and soft infrastructure. Mm. And this is the only message uh, that uh, in our discussions with China, we are emphasizing a lot. Uh, uh, I will be going uh, tomorrow when this summit is over to the One Belt, One Road Summit in Beijing. And the message that I will have is hard infrastructure, the roads, the rail links, the digital connectivity is very is a necessary condition, but it is insufficient if you do not build the competitiveness of the companies that will use this hard infrastructure. And this is why it's very important that the initiative caters for both the hard but also the soft mm -hmm. infrastructure. And I think this is something that uh, China has integrated into its own uh, tools uh, and it's paying more attention to building entrepreneurship, quality, uh, skills uh, and all the softer part that would help us put the hard part to good use. And, this and, I, and I think China has great experience in doing that. Yeah. If, if we look at the China story, I think it's not just about pure, simple manufacturing or infrastructure. It's really an amazing story of how they have uh, built capabilities, built skills, built expertise across a variety of industries. And that is really what makes it so remarkable. And, and uh, definitely through the One, bolt, uh, one uh, Road, One, one Belt uh, initiative, everybody's going to benefit as a consequence. You know, as the hard infrastructure comes in, the soft part usually follows. Uh, so from that point of view, I think it's definitely a positive development. And uh, you know, as I said earlier, it's not really a question of whether trade between China and ASEAN is strong. The, the real thinking has to be now as a next step within ASEAN, how do we you know, really leverage the unique capabilities within each of the countries in the region? Let's address that issue. How do you think yes. that yes. can work better? Yes. Uh, so on this one, uh, yeah. at least, uh, from where we sit in the International Trade Center, we've asked businesses. We've surveyed businesses in this region, in Cambodia, in mm. Thailand, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, and we've asked, what is it that is holding you uh, from increasing your intra-ASEAN trade? And the answer is very simple, non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. Tariffs today are 1% to 2% of the costs of doing business, doing trade in ASEAN, but the non-tariff barriers is 20 to 30%. And by the way, this 20 to 30 percent is an impossible barrier to jump for 90 percent of businesses which are small and medium enterprises. Yes. So non-tariff barriers, procedures, standards, uh, quality, uh, uh, regulations, that's where uh, we need to go yes. with a screwdriver and tighten or loosen the screws uh, to make this intra-ASEAN work more. Uh, for uh, the 90 percent of his business, Minister, you have been in discussions. Yeah, uh, the uh, from the last last week uh, ASEAN summit in uh, uh, leader summits in ASEAN leader summit in Manila, we have decided uh, with the 
Malaysia is uh, heading that. We're going to take stocks of what is tariff barriers in, in ASEAN you know, countries. So we, we will work on that. We try to remove it systematically, like I said, yeah. and see how we can combine mm -hmm. or, or compromise. So um, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see this, you know, that uh, something is working, uh, something is taking uh, 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 initiative. Uh, you know, Malaysians, uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia is taking this initiative, and we, we agree that let's work on that and remove it step by step. Of course, though, you know, if you don't do it, uh, looking in as a whole big picture, you wouldn't see what's going on, because each, of, each one of us in the country is trying to protect ourselves. From, uh, from, from other uh, trade outside. So um, Cambodia is happy. Because why? Because we would like to, uh, uh, to move our, our, our goods and services as, as fast as possible to other countries like China. Mm. That's because right now we have to use uh, you know, other countries, near the neighboring countries, to, uh, to move our goods and services, which still have some areas. At this stage, I'd like to open the discussion to the floor. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. And I think a mic will be coming your way. Please. Um, you could, mic. could you just hang on? The, yeah. Um, thank you. Guy uh, Apovi, I'm the um, president of the Euro Cham in Laos. Uh, I have a question uh, about the smaller countries in uh, ASEAN. Uh, what we see in uh, ASEAN is uh, now that uh, some of the bigger countries have bilateral uh, trade agreement with the uh, EU. Uh, what we are concerned is that with the development of uh, ASEAN, the, ga the gap with, with uh, widen between the big countries and the small countries uh, in the Asian uh, over a uh, long run and uh, that uh, it will be very difficult in the future for smaller countries to attract FDI because of that widening gap and the disadvantage that the smaller country would have regarding to the uh, bigger countries. Uh, how do you see that? Would you like to address the question to anyone in particular? I don't know, maybe to the, to the panel, so. Arantxa, would you like to take that? I think uh, Pan, oh, Pan yeah, is the Pan minister of the country. <laughs> we, we, uh, I, I, can, uh, I can sympathize with him. <laughs> because, uh, you know, Laos and Cambodia, Laos is landlocked yeah. uh, countries in, uh, uh, in ASEAN. And uh, Cambodia also is a, has a small economy which we really worried all the time that, you know, uh, countries within ASEAN is doing uh, FTAs with, uh, uh, you know, like EU, with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, other countries, uh, bigger countries. But uh, that wouldn't stop them. I say that that's their free choice. It's up to us. It's Cambodian is working on opening up more markets. Yes. We are working FTAs with the Eurasians, European, you know, E. AC, mm. we call you know the uh, the former Soviet Union, which has huge, huge. It's a huge market, mm. and you haven't tapped that yet. You know, so I, and we're working with other countries as well, Belarus and so on. But the, so I, I think you have to take initiative, because the fact that we, how can you stop other countries not to do uh, FTAs with other countries, <laughs> other regions? I believe that this came out from us. They came out from uh, to 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 find other uh, possibilities in uh, for other markets. That's what I can answer to you, because I cannot tell that uh, you can avoid that because that's that says sovereignty. Yeah. I mean, personally, I don't think it's a question of size. You know, otherwise Singapore wouldn't have done what it has done over all these years. You know, they're really tiny. You know, and uh, South Korea wouldn't be as uh, successful as they are sitting between China and Japan. So it's not a question of size. It's really a question of skills and capabilities. You know, if, sure. if, you, know, if you ask a firm, why would you invest? You know, it's either it's a huge market or there's huge skills which make it competitive to do something in that country. So, so I think the answer is really to focus on 
uh, what are your core competencies, what are the skills you can incubate, uh, and then business will come. You know, it's as simple as that, yeah. right? I, 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 wouldn't say, uh, I, I agree with you on, on, on that, but what you're seeing is we have to take initiatives Correct. on looking at each one of your weaknesses and also your, your, your strength. That was a question? Hello, good afternoon. My name is Trent Camito. I'm a global shaper from the Philippines. I'm also the founder and the executive director of a foundation that is Youth First Initiative Philippines Incorporated. Actually, um, this is a very good platform because we're having a global discussions regarding how are we going to um, rethink about the regional trade, so on and so forth. But I'm, I would like actually to root back on how are we going to strategically position young people like, for example, in the ASEAN integration and the regionalism and everything about involving trade and uh, anything about that. Like, for example, in our, um, uh, in our company, we have Producto Local, wherein we would like actually to produce local products and bring that to the global market. However, we don't know actually what is our role in terms of, you know, with the ASEAN integration. So that's my question. I guess she's talking to me also. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. Um, well, you know, um, for small companies like SMEs, you know, and also for export goods and, thick, uh, uh, and services uh, uh, goods, then uh, we, we try to do what we, we call single windows, uh, you know, as in single windows. And then uh, it's, being, it's a work in progress also because we, uh, each country try to build what we call national single windows first. And then we, we, we will combine, and they all harmonize. And then uh, in that, you have a whole rules, uh, rules and, and database that a uh, gentleman can, can look into it and what we can export uh, and what kind of uh, tariffs and, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, you can check the uh, ASEAN secretariats on, on this uh, in Jakarta or look into uh, in the internet. What I can do, uh, what I can suggest is working on the e commerce. You know, you, uh, you try to develop that, and e-commerce is not just an activities. I think it's a catalyst for change uh, to to develop uh, trade, uh, uh, to develop SMEs, to develop entrepreneurships, uh, because uh, it, it 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 has a huge spectrum of of um, of pushing and, and pulling, you know, trade uh, in, into a, a bigger pictures, especially for young entrepreneurs and and so on. So. Uh, my suggestion is uh, perhaps maybe uh, um, looking into into those uh, those uh, aspects, and we can uh, we can move uh, things forward. Cambodia is really uh, keen on we are chose uh, we are selected as a pilot countries uh, in uh, WTOs and on uh, as pilot country for e-commerce, uh, e and also we are part of the what we call friends of e-commerce. We are really uh, active in trying to make uh, sure that uh, using e-commerce as a catalyst uh, for growth, for trade, for gender equality, for you name it, you know, the, the whole thing. Thank you. And just to follow up, by 2020, I think more than 50% of the population in ASEAN will be millennials. I mean, uh, is there a considered effort to, for them to be contributing to the economy and to trade? Is there a framework that the organization has come up with or considering? There's, a, there's one pillar talking about culture and education. That's, uh, there, there has a specific principle and, and guideline uh, to develop this for, for young people. It's, it's in the ASEAN Charter. So uh, we're looking at not, uh, uh, the uh, 2025 20, and how how we can move the ASEAN forward. I, uh, I invite you to take a look at that and, and see it's, this is all in, they're all in details. Trade, culture, and, and uh, investments, and, and the uh, infrastructure. So this is, is very, very, very detailed things that uh, I, I believe that uh, the ASEAN leaders have, have a long visions, not just for 25 years down the road, it's probably 50 years, like somebody said, 50 years more and <laughs> even 100 years more down the road. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Dan. <laughs> mm -hmm. No question from the floor? 
I want to touch on then. That's, that's fine. Oh, JG's mind. <laughs> <laughs> Is it worth challenging the assumption? Do we have the mic? Hi, Daniel Moss, Bloomberg. Full disclosure. <laughs> Moderate. I heard a little bit of this, but I wonder if the panel wants to expand upon it. Should we challenge the assumption that globalization is in retreat? There's been a lot of talk about things the new administration in the US has done. But there have been some things they haven't done. What? Haven't withdrawn from NAFTA. Haven't labelled China a currency manipulator. No, no tariffs on China. No. Hated XM Bank. Now we love XM Bank. Is it worth talking about the things that haven't happened? Well, I, what I would tell you is that I totally disagree with the fact that globalization is in retreat. Globalization is not in retreat. What is different is the answer we're giving to globalization. And the reason why globalization is not in retreat is because it is driven by technology. And technology is moving today as fast as any in any, any other point in time in history. And this is the slowest it would be if we look into the future. And this is what will, is driving globalization. Now, what, what changes, uh, what has changed, is the answers that governments and societies have given to globalization. You have societies where uh, the, the challenging and the questioning of globalization is much lower in the developed world. Take Canada. Why? Because uh, the distributional effects of globalization have been better managed. Uh, you want another example? Take uh, the very healthy debate that has taken place in France with the, uh, in the recent presidential election, where the candidate that has said globalization is here, and frankly, let's look at whether it's bad or not, has been elected president. So I don't agree that globalization is in retreat. But I think we have to be very careful with not pretending that globalization will self-manage. We have to give it answers. We have to harness it. We have to provide. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, measures to uh, ensure it benefits or the, the, the costs and the benefits are shared in a better way. Just one, I, mean, I, I broadly ag agree with you, but I, I do think there's something we need to, to worry about, which is that across the advanced world, there has been a polarization of the labor markets where we're losing a lot of the middle class blue collar jobs. Yeah. And some of those have shown up in places like like Vietnam and Cambodia, and you can see that the reverse process is happening. But as long as that's happening, and it's largely driven by technology, not trade per se, right? But trade is going to take some of the brunt for that, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be a little bit careful that we're clear on what's driving these trends and that societies around the world are, are developing safety nets or, or, or programs for mobility to deal with that. So far, these technological displacements of particularly um, uh, assembling, assembly work and all haven't affected the developing world. It's showing up a little bit in Mexico, a little bit in Brazil, but with the advance of robotics and all, it's not clear that, that the developing world will be immune from that, those effects as well. We have just enough, enough time to do a, a wrap. Let's go down the line or in circle, however they may be. The key takeaway from today's discussion, Minister. I believe that we are uh, sort of uh, understand each other, you know, uh, that uh, globalization is still here. And uh, Cambodia is, uh, is one of the uh, supporter, big supporters. I, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, Your key concern would be? The key concern, uh, globalization, is probably uh, uh, not enough funds to build up uh, the uh, interconnectivities and, and uh, to, to, to make trade works. Um, I, I think that's just a matter of time working with you on soft mm -hmm. and hard, and so we can combine that and, and to make uh, trade and the globalization. We believe that globalization uh, and regionalism is uh, make trade works and give more jobs. And I believe that it's not oh uh, this is small economies. It cannot be part of the uh, globalizations of uh, other big countries. That's not true because we can contribute. It's part of uh, I call um, complementarity of things. You know, we can do more things. We can we can build uh, car seats. We can build wirings to be part of the uh, big components of automobiles. Uh, and then 
this kind of thing here will, will be part of the, the whole big thing. It's not made in, let's say, Thailand. It's made in ASEAN, you know, these uh, products coming out. Uh, so this, this regionalism here should uh, help us more and, and then, uh, to create more, more jobs. And also, like my prime minister mentioned about is education. So it, it's sort of like give us a, a platform to learn more, us to learn more from other peers, other groups of people who are already more advanced uh, in, in, in their technology, on their ed education. Cambodia is not really uh, scared of uh, jumping into, I usually call the big uh, boy playing field. We jump in and let's see how we can do. And then it takes a while. We, it uh, takes some time, but we, we know how to, do the, uh, to play the games. That's uh, something that we, we believe. And talking about the uh, uh, looking in, uh, you, most of the people uh, around the world is worrying about what Trump is doing, what Trump did. But for the past 100 years, you, like you, no, sorry, past 100 days, like you said that we, we see Trump sort of, sort of stabilizing himself on making decisions not jumpy or not making decisions on uh, different things. So we believe that it's just a spike in the American histories. Because we have, we look in the past in Amer American histories as there's pro prohibitions and on, on those things, you know. And then so there's some spikes there. And uh, perhaps maybe uh, uh, we wish that uh, it's coming back <laughs> to, uh, to the real world. Thank you. Arancha? Well, my key takeaway is that if we want globalization to work, we have to invest in people. We have to invest in empowering the youth, the men, and the women. Uh, it should not be forgotten. Uh, it's 50% uh, of our economies, and very often uh, not necessarily at the center of policy making. Um, we need to help them, empower them to be able to adapt and adjust as globalization obliges us to adapt and to adjust. That's in my view, what we need to have as the top priority. Okay. I totally agree with Rancho. Uh, for us as a business, you know, capital today in today's environment is not the issue. It's really capable, skilled people. And what is also challenging is the rate of change that we see in the industry and the skill sets, you know, 10, 15 years ago have evolved. And what you need to be successful today is very different uh, from what it was in the past. And so there's this need to constantly invest in upskilling, to be ready for the new complex reality of the world. Um, so that to me is the biggest concern. But other than that, I think uh, globalization continues and, uh, and, and it's a strong positive that it continues because ultimately it benefits everyone. Mm -hmm. Professor. Uh, I would like to say that um, economic development still has served as the uh, key tone for the Asia Pacific area, especially for ASEAN and China, also India. Uh, for those aim, we need to do things. One, and just like the ladies, education, very important, which will change your life. And another thing is that some of the uh, uh, manufacturing industry and infrastructure is there serve as a critical factors for economic development. For this one, I think we can do much more if you don't have the manufacturing products, it's very difficult to change the um, trade deficit, deficit from ASEAN, between ASEAN and China, right? This one is needed. And the second one, I think, as for China, it also need, on the one hand, it need to make some the contribution for the area. For the other hand, China need to keep the low key to learn value from the surrounding countries. ASEAN countries, India, as well as from the different countries. Let's, that's really is the important factors that make China grow substantially and last for long. Thank you. It's quick, again, just repeat, take the long view of these processes, because I think they are long view. Second is, again, and has come up with capabilities, both on the worker side, but also on the firm side. But I can expand that further to say that uh, societies need to develop the capacity to manage risk, getting firms to invest in technology, invest in, in physical capital requires, is, is fundamentally a bet. Entering a new market is fundamentally a bet. So we need to 
train our firms to, to manage risk and to have financial sectors and other systems that manage that risk. Other things, for instance, getting back to the youth issue, I was working in one ASEAN country where there was a you know, high-tech incubator, but every time the kids filed for a patent, it got stolen by the government. Um, or at least that's what they told me, okay? Um, so all, all by way of saying however apocryphal that is, is that you know, intellectual property rights regimes matter also to get people going. So all those things we need to work on and just signing the agreement ain't enough. Um, so that's a big judgment. And the third thing is don't underestimate. Right now, ASEAN has moderate safety nets. As things become more sophisticated, as people accumulate more human capital, as moving from one job to a second appropriate job during a transition becomes harder, you will need those safety nets to work. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists today. And thank you for joining us. <laughs>